Good evening, and welcome to First Thursdays at the Marin County Law Library. Um, I'd like to take a moment and welcome everyone that's with us tonight, and also to give a shout-out to the Law Library. Um, I believe last night we had a Lawyers in the Law Library event. We will have another one coming up on September 22nd. I'd like to invite everyone that has a need to have a brief meeting with an attorney to get in touch with our law librarian, Stephen Richards. If you go to the website, you'll see the instructions for this. You will need to register for this program, but it is an opportunity for folks to have a 20-minute consultation with an attorney at no cost to try and do issue spotting and perhaps even resolve an issue. But Lawyers in the Library is a continuing program, and I'd like to take a moment to credit um, the folks that helped develop this, the many lawyers who have donated their time, and of course the law library staff. We are quite literally on the cusp of our sixth anniversary. I believe the first date we presented Lawyers in the Library was six years ago in early October. I will take this time to, add, to thank our former law librarian and our current law librarian who worked so hard to bring this together. At the same time, I'd like to make a brief announcement um, of a sad event that occurred this week. One of our law library staff passed away, Ron Lieberman, and I'd like to take a moment to thank Ron for his service to the library and also to send our wishes and thoughts to his family. We very much appreciate our law library staff. Without Stephen and the three individuals who staff the law library, we would not be open five days a week. For those of you who can remember us being shut down, and it hasn't been that long ago for COVID, may I invite you again to go to our webpage and see that we are open Mondays through Thursdays, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., and Friday, 10 to 1 p.m. This was an extraordinary reopening for us. We hope that you will take a moment, go over and introduce yourself to our new law librarian. And by the way, happy six-month anniversary. It doesn't seem like you've been here six months, but I look at the amount of work that Stephen has accomplished and the good things that have already happened and we are very, very much appreciative of all that he does. At this time, I'd like to introduce Richard Zeman, who comes to us tonight to discuss an overview of a topic that in the past our previous law librarian had said came up on several occasions at Lawyers in the Library. These were questions about the field of Social Security disability, how one qualifies for it, how one might apply for it, and what issues they may face. We're fortunate to have Richard Zeman, who is the managing partner at Levinson and Zeman, come to us tonight, and he has an outstanding background. This is a gentleman who, as a paralegal, volunteered for the SSI for Children program at the Homeless Advocacy Project in San Francisco. For those of you that are familiar with it, this is an absolutely wonderful program that even during the time our speaker was a paralegal had a specific program for children and SSI. He comes to us tonight as a long-term practitioner in this field. He is a member of the Marin County um, Bar Association and he practices in multiple counties here in Marin. I'm very, very pleased tonight to introduce Richard Zeman. We are very grateful for his time, and I hope all of you will learn a great deal tonight. Keep in mind, this is an overview. It is probably not an opportunity to have specific case questions answered, but it may well give you food for thought and the information you need to find questions about any cases you yourself may be pursuing. Richard, thank you so much. The table is yours. Okay, thanks. So, as you said, I am Richard Zeman. Um, I was invited to, to do a presentation today um, on Social Security Disability. I have been 
you know, I handled cases at all levels of the administrative process from initial application all the way to the entity appeals council and in federal court. I've been doing it as an attorney since uh, 04. And yeah, I did do briefly for um, SSI for children back, I guess that was 1994 um, before I went to law school. So um, I'm not sure I'm still a member of the Marin County Bar Association. So that's probably should put my website, but I practiced in Marin for a long time. I still do cases up there. I, I left Marin County in August of 19 to come back closer to home which turned out to be really good timing because COVID was several months later and um, anyway, it worked out well. But I still do cases in Moran, Sonoma, all the way up to Mendocino and, and Lake County as well as all around the Bay Area. Um, now, Social Security can be you know, a, a vast subject. So everything I mentioned today can have extensive subtopics and different exceptions depending on the specific facts of the case. So I can't cover anything, but I'll try to answer questions. If you have questions, you know, I, I can see what I can do. And again, this is general information. Please don't take any of this as specific legal advice. I don't know the facts of anyone's cases or I won't know enough facts. If you want advice, call, you can call my office. You can call another attorney, get some advice. There, you know, I don't know one charges for consults as far as I know. I don't charge for consults, most attorneys do. So I'm gonna cover the social security programs um, themselves, um, applying and appealing, and then kind of what's needed. So for disabilities, you, you want to apply. If something happens, you're injured, you have an illness, some combination, and you believe it can't work. Now, the first thing you need to understand, you know, what is disability under social security's rules? And you know, every program has their own definition. So for social security, it's you have a condition of conditions, physical and or mental, that prevent you from working and have lasted or expected to last 12 continuous months or longer resulting. Basic definition. Now for social security, disability is considered a legal term. And what that means is, is it's up to them to decide if you're disabled. It's not your doctor writing a letter saying my patient's disabled isn't um, something that they have to follow. That some other program found you disabled, you know, they'll look at it, but it doesn't, they're not bound by it. Even if it's the VA, it's their decision to make. Um, Social Security is different from other programs, uh, disability programs like California, EDD, state disability. They'll focus on the essential functions of your job. And, and if you've just stopped working, you should look into EDD. It's, it's a good program. It's much easier to get. It's shorter term, but it's, it's a good benefit. And I, I can't advise on that, but it's one you should consider that's out there for you. And it is easy in the term that it sometimes just takes your doctor to check a box on a form. Um, there's workers' compensation, but that's all related to work-related injuries. And anyone who's, and anyone who's dealt with that um, will know that can be a long, ugly fight trying to determine whether something's work-related or not. Uh, and then they set benefits accordingly based on percentages. With Social Security, it's the ability to do any full-time work consistent with your age, education, and work experience. Whether you can do your past job or not is not always so important, though it does get more important as you get older into your 50s, especially after 55. Um, for example, if you're a younger person under 50, maybe a highly skilled tech worker, Social Security won't care so much if you can do that work. They'll look to see if you can just do simple, basic full-time work, mail sorter, hand packager, they like to, to look at. If you're 55 or older and a carpenter or a plumber with a high school diploma, the rules change a lot in your favor. So it, it really matters um, what your age is, what your past work is. Um, you know, Social Security is an all or nothing program. You're either disabled by the rules or you're not. There's no in between, there's no partial disability, there's no percentages, but unlike say workers' compensation, social security considers every condition. Um, doesn't matter if it happened at work, it doesn't matter if you slipped in the shower, doesn't matter where they come from. If they're preventing you from working in any way, limiting your function, it should be considered. Now, Things that aren't considered so much are substance abuse problems. I'm not going to go into the drug and alcohol rules. Just basically understand if, if your condition 
if your disability is, is based on, on a, um, a substance abuse disorder, then you may not be eligible for benefits. It's a whole other program uh, or a whole, whole other set of rules. So the basic programs, first, you're gonna have social security disability insurance. Um, and that's an insurance program. You pay into disability um, through your work, your FICA withholding, just like you do for social security retirement. You need to accumulate enough quarters in a specific period of time to become insured for disability. And you have to prove you're disabled while you're still insured. And for some people, that, that's an issue. Some people may not have enough quarters or their insurance period has passed and, and that raises issues. And reach out and you know, seek help if that happens. Um, SSDI can pay up to 12 months prior to the application day, and you'll be eligible for Medicare 24 months after the first date of benefit eligibility. So say I applied for disability and I went back and my first date of eligibility was January 1 of 2022. My Medicare wouldn't start till January 1 of 24. That 24 month rule just is, it's the rule. Nothing you can do about it. Hopefully they'll change it at some point, but it's something to realize uh, that there's going to be a lag in coverage. If you have minor children, or I think even 18 year olds still in high school, there may be benefits for them if you're awarded SSDI. Um, it can be up to 50% of what your benefit, benefit rate is, but again, it depends. There's not always extra benefits for the family. Sometimes there is. And you should always list the children, even if they don't live with you. If you have a spouse who's staying home, with a child, I think under 16, then there could be benefits for the spouse if you're awarded SSDI. So that's something else to consider. Now, the other program is SSI Supplemental Security Income. Now, this one isn't an insurance program. They don't worry about whether you meet the insured criteria. It's means tested, meaning you can't have more than 2,000 in total resources or 3,000 per couple. SSI will pay as of the application date if it goes back that far, and you'll get Medi-Cal immediately. There's no 24 month period. Now, the issue of resources is, is complex and, and I'm not gonna go into all that, but just understand those SSI rules are, they can be very inflexible and harsh. The claims representatives have very little discretion and the rules do not reflect the financial realities of today especially here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I mean, 2,000 in resources is not much, um, but it's something you have to be aware of, you know. Um, you can get both SSI and SSDI. If your SSDI is very low, they can supplement it with SSI. Um, there's one other program I wanna mention, and this is the Disabled Adult Child Program. And if someone is eligible for SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance, or SSA Retirement, their disabled adult child can receive SSDI on their parent's account if disabled prior to age 22. You know, in many cases, the parent's not going to become eligible or disabled till the till the child's well past 22. And then you have to prove, you know, just really back, you know, two years, five years, 10 years back to the when the child's before age 22. So if you think you have a child in that situation that could possibly be eligible, save everything. Hang on to the school records, special education, IEPs, any medical records, any evaluations, um, records of any services you're getting, regional center services, other, other therapeutic services, because those aren't kept. You know, medical facilities and schools do not keep everything forever. And you will need as much as you can to prove disability back to that age 22, social security is not gonna do you any favors. You know, If you only have it back to 24, they're gonna say, well, we don't see how it's back to 22. You know, So you know, it's a tough battle sometimes, but the more you save, the better it is. All right, so you're gonna apply for social security disability. You hit the point where you don't think you can work, you're gonna apply, there's several, a couple ways to do it. You can go online to ssa.gov, um, They'll usually have you set up a My SSA account um, and go on with the application process. If you don't think so, you can do it by phone. You have to use their, their main number now. They're not giving out their local numbers. That's 800-772-1213. They will um, they'll give you an appointment. Um, either the online app or on phone, they'll ask you if you want to apply for SSI, if you think you're eligible. You know, there should be information on the webpage about 
the type of medical and non-medical information you'll need to apply. You know, make sure you're on the Social Security website, ssa.gov. There's pictures and squares, and there's a square for disability up in the right-hand corner. No one should be popping up to do a, an instant chat or ask you to complete a questionnaire. If that's happening, you're on the wrong website. You're probably in some big law firm site or some other um, big company site, and that might not be where you want to be. Sometimes, you know, that application can feel very daunting and complicated and people just, just angst over it and they delay. They don't feel they can get the information together and they keep putting it off. If that's happening to you, reach out and call someone. You can call me, call another attorney, um, but don't, don't delay the application if you think you, you should be applying. Um, there's agencies beyond attorneys. There's, I think in San Rafael, you can contact the Rent Center for Independent Living. You can maybe look at Bay Area Legal Aid. Um, some places have kind of disappeared since COVID. If you're on general assistance, they had a wonderful program there. And um, they just went. I haven't heard from them since COVID started, and I don't think it's coming. So, but, but reach out. Reach out for help. I do initial applications. Other attorneys do. Like I said, there's agencies that will do them at no cost. Don't let the inability to get information together keep delaying your application. Um, it's probably not as vital as you think anyway, and you can always fill in the blanks later. All right, so you got your application filed. Social Security is gonna send your application to a state office. It's uh, Disability Determination Services. You're gonna be contacted by the state of California. It's usually in California. If you're in Marin County, it'll probably be out of Sacramento, maybe Roseville, or it can go other places if there's overload. They're the ones that gather records. From the sources you tell them about on the application, they send out questionnaires, they may send you out for exams. You know, those questionnaires they send are long and tedious and redundant, but some of that information is really important, um, including describing your password, especially if you're in your 50s. Uh, you want to be honest on these forms, but you have to be careful that you're being accurate. And I always give the one example from when I was first working for Ms. Levinson, I was doing one of these questionnaires over the phone with the client and he told me he was going swimming three times a week. And she heard me read that back to him and she said, ask him when he last went swimming. And I did and he said it had been over a year because his back hurt too much. But he was prepared to have the form say he still did it three times. That stuff happens all the time. And while it's not something that we can't overcome, it follows you all the way through your case. So, you know, you don't want to put down things you'd like to do or you think you should do or people would like you to see you do. You want to be accurate on what you're unable to do. Same with past work. Um, you know, if you had to lug around 50, 60 pounds, say so. If you had to be on your feet all day, say so. That's all extremely important. Um, you know, think in terms of both physical and mental, you know. Uh, maybe physically you don't have a problem getting dressed and getting in the shower, or maybe mentally you're too depressed and you stay in bed for four or five days in a row. You know, um, you want to be as accurate as possible on these and really describe how you're limited. And of course, if you're represented, you get help with it and people talk you through it. Now, this will take uh, three to six months is what they tell you, and that's pretty, pretty standard. You know, and, and during the process, you may speak to a disability analyst. Um, person kind of isn't, you know, guides your case through, but the decisions are made by internal doctors, a lot, much like insurance companies. And those doctors will never talk to you. They're never going to examine you. They're going to make a decision based on, 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 the, on the paper review. And I've done this a long time. I've never spoken to one of those doctors. So it just, it's just how it is. It's a tough part of the system. It's not always fair. They're very narrow in how they review the records and apply the rules, but it is, it is what it is. So if you're denied, don't, um, don't be too discouraged. It's not uncommon. Um, the, the mistake people make is they give up and then they decide maybe, you know, 10 months later to try again and they keep starting at the hardest part of, of, of the process with the first step. Um, you should appeal. You have 60 days to appeal, technically 65. I wouldn't take it to the deadline. But on the other hand, if you do miss the deadline, um, don't panic, you know, don't give up, contact somebody, call an attorney, call social security. There's often very good reasons why you're late. 
and you know you can provide a reason and keep your case going so you know before you give up at any point of the process call somebody okay even if you think it's over you know it might not be so the next step is the reconsideration that's your first appeal and it goes right up to the same people who just denied the case um what they do is they give it to another team you know, hand it over to another team and the reality is unless there's really something new you know like you've gotten much worse in that short period or there's some evidence or records that weren't available it's likely they're going to deny you um again that's just part of the process you have the same 60 days and the next appeal is the request for hearing now the hearing gets you out of that state level and back into the federal process and it's with an administrative law judge and I think it's the most open and fair part of the process. You know, it's the only step in the entire disability process, you may go all the way up to federal court, where you're going to talk to the clerk that he's deciding the case. When you get to actually testify and, and have the person deciding your case ask you questions. Um, you know, if you have an attorney, they can present the case, cross-examine witnesses, present a, a written argument and so on you know and i mean that generally obviously there's going to be judges not everyone wants to appear before you know that's in every legal process but but still this is the one part where you're involved um now you have the right to do a hearing unrepresented there's no requirement that you hire somebody i wouldn't recommend it i think it's important to understand the process and how hearings are conducted you know to understand what matters and what might be just a formality no, unrepresented claimants often don't know which specific issues have to be addressed or whether the case can swing on just a couple of facts. Sometimes, sometimes there's just a couple of facts that have to be, be proven or a couple of issues to deal with um, to swing a case one way or the other. And everything else is just kind of uh, in the background. But you know, you need someone who knows that. Um, you need someone to kind of keep you calm through the hearing. Um, let you know when something you know doesn't need to be addressed and you know sometimes clients get get worked up and they want to talk and they want to explain themselves and sometimes they're their own worst enemies i think having someone in there who can guide you through as long as they're advocating for you can guide you through and just you know help you help you present the case as best you can you know and there's also almost always going to be a vocational expert and sometimes there's a medical expert, psych, uh, mental health or physical. And it's not likely an unrepresented client claimant's going to understand what the vocational experts testifying about. Um, their job is to determine based on certain factors the judge presents whether a person can return to their past work or whether there's other jobs in the national economy. It gets very really complex and it's it's um it's it, it's difficult at times. I can't count the amount of times that people have come to me after being denied at a hearing and tell me that they were so sure they were going to win because the vocational expert said they couldn't work when it's not really what happened, you know, and not understanding the process. You hear that and you think I've got it made and then you get the decision and it's unfavorable. So I would say be represented. You don't have to hire me, you know, but get somebody who, who knows what they're doing that you're comfortable with that can advocate for you. And, and, and really give you a, a shot. Um, you know, the time frame again, the reconsideration before is about three months for the hearing. I would say from the time you do the request for hearings, about 12 months to get a hearing date. COVID changed a lot of that, but it seems to be getting closer to that again. Um, and the decision is about one to three months from the hearing. They've almost all been by phone since March of 20. Um, they do offer some by video through Microsoft Teams. I've never done one of those. Um, if people insist on, on in person, because uh, you, you don't have to do the phone, um, they're, they're arranging. I've done one in person. So for me, though, I'm preferring to stick to the phone here until they're fully open and lift all the different restrictions that go in. So um, if it's me, I'll probably want to do it by phone. You know, if you get denied, Again, just one more step to the appeals council. And that's the last step in the administrative level. That's the last one within social security. It's generally a paper review. You don't talk to anybody. And the biggest difference at the appeals council is, you know, they're back in Falls Church, Virginia, is it's not just a question anymore of whether you're disabled. Um, 
you have to show that the judge erred. And, you know, in, in the pellet law, there, there's a theory that reasonable minds can differ in being the same facts, some version of that. So, you know, while there might be evidence supporting a finding that you're disabled, the fact that the judge read the evidence differently and denied your case doesn't automatically mean there's an error. And, you know, it's hard to read at this level. They have a very low allowance rate. Um, you know, they can completely reverse a judge's decision and issue a favorable decision. I, I can count on, on one hand how many times I've had that happen. Usually, if you get any relief, they're going to send it back to the judge for another hearing. And that gives you a whole other chance, you know, to win the case. That's the, that's the Social Security Administrative process. You can still take a case to federal court if you're not successful with the Appeals Council. And that's the same thing as the, as the, as the Appeals Council um, in terms of you have to prove error. It's written arguments. I think the federal court gives a much better and more thorough review of the case and applies the law much better than the Appeals Council does. I, I, I've had much more success in federal court than I have at the Appeals Council. And I think most attorneys who do federal court work would probably tell you the same thing. So, you know, sometimes cases have to go that far. Sometimes um, there's problems with the cases. You go through the earlier level. Sometimes there's some bad facts you have to deal with. Sometimes records aren't available. Sometimes you just get bad luck of the draw and you get, um, get early doctors early on or a judge who just isn't seeing the case the way you want them to see it. You know, anything can happen, but you know, if you keep fighting, you may end up with the benefits. Um, hopefully, you don't have to go that far, but people do. You know, I have cases in federal court. There's tons of cases in federal court. So, um, and if you do get to federal court, you can also start over with the new claim in the meantime. All right, so that's that's a kind of a thumbnail sketch of the process. So, what's most important to a claim? And, and I would say this: medical records, medical evidence. Um, you know, disability cannot be based on subjective complaints. You know, social security cannot just take your word for it. Nothing's obvious to them. You know, the idea that, well, geez, if I could, I'd be working at my job for, you know, 200,000 a year. Doesn't social security understand that? They don't understand that. Um, that's not what they look at. And even if they, if they believe you, they can't take your word for it. There has to be medical support for your condition. Um, Whatever it is, it has to be diagnosed by acceptable, acceptable medical techniques and by what they call acceptable medical sources. And, you know, and, and once you have that, then they could look at other things to determine how severe it is and how limiting. They can listen to your testimony. They can look at other parts of your doctor's records. They can take, you know, listen to statements from family, friends, or employers. But it's still a program that's based on medical evidence. And also, simply, they want to see that people are, are engaging in treatment, trying to get better, you know, especially younger claims. They want to see that you're trying. And, and that's as much a human nature element as it is a legal one. You know, the judges, you know, if someone 35 years old has disabling conditions and has said, I'm not going to the doctor anymore, they're going to be hesitant to want to give you the benefits, you know. It doesn't mean you won't get them. I'm not saying that. But just understand you're dealing with people, you know. Um, and, you know, there can be any number of reasons why people don't have treatment or have, have minimal treatment. I've done cases with minimal treatment. It, it happens. Um, you know, people lose their, their, um, their, their coverage. Um, my clients in more rural areas and not even so much rural areas, lack of transportation, lack of gas money. Um, it's hard to get to the doctors, people with uh, serious psychiatric conditions tend to go off their meds and you know, feel they don't need them and, or, you know, get tired of talking to their doctors. All, you know, all of that can be presented and considered. You know, nothing is really the end of the world with a security case if, you, if you're deserving there's ways to present it and, and keep fighting. But, you know, you don't want to do that on purpose. You know, if you can get it, you know, stay plugged into treatment as best you can. Um, letters and assessments from doctors can help, though more and more doctors seem less, you know, inclined to want to get involved, or what they don't want to do is give the kind of opinions that Social Security needs the most, which is, you know, an opinion on your functioning, if you can lift, carry, how long you can stand or walk, or, 
you know, functioning from a mental health range, you know, in terms of focus and interacting with others. And doctors sometimes push back and want to give those specific opinions. So, but that's that's not the end of the world. That happens. I, I don't get many doctors' assessments anymore. Um, and you're left with what's in the doctor's chart numbers. So because of that, it's important that you communicate with your doctors. I don't mean you have to go in there and, you know, go for 30 minutes about how bad everything is. But what often happens to me is I'll have clients who will tell me how much something hurts, how difficult things are from just day-to-day -day activities, whether physical, mental, and so on. They tell me, but then they go into their doctor's office and say, yeah, I'm doing fine and go in and out. And I get it. People get tired of talking to doctors. They get tired of telling the story. They want to just go and leave and but, you know, this is a legal process, you know, so at least communicate. If something's bothering you, tell your doctor. If, you know, if the medications aren't working as well, tell your doctor. Because um, that's going to be in there. You know, that, that's what gets in the record. That's what they look at. Um, in terms of, of your doctor assisting in the claim, I would say this. Unless your doctor is recommending disability or your doctor, you know, says they, they want to help, you know, I would just focus on your treatment and your condition. Um, you know, sometimes doctors can get a little, little edgy if they think you're there just for a disability claim. Um, sometimes doctors don't understand the standard of disability. They might think that you can do something. They might think that you can do some part-time work, but that's not really what Social Security is looking at. And, you know, they may not be supportive because they don't truly understand the rules. So, um, beyond that, like I said, beyond the medical, you know, sometimes you can get third party statements from family, employers, school records, special ed records, all that stuff, all that can help. So it's kind of the overview. I, I'm not sure what more I, I can add to that. Um, and I'll take any questions. Well, Are we waiting for questions or? In terms of discussions that a patient may have with a doctor, is it often the doctor that they are having their very first discussion of, of long-term disability with? You know, that's a tough one. It depends. Sometimes doctors suggest it. Sometimes patients suggest it and ask, um, but again, you have to feel your doctor out. Doesn't you know? I, I don't want to list any certain facilities, but there's some where you know your doctor might say, "Yeah, you 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 probably should you know go for disability," but I'm not going to be able to help you know. So, um, you know, you can talk to them about it, let them know that you're pursuing it, but I would always make sure your doctor knows that you're there to try and treat your condition and to try and get better and comply. And I wouldn't tell anyone you have to take medications, you have to get injections, you have to get um, a surgery. But if you don't want to, talk to your doctor about it. But, um, you know, a doctor is more likely to be supportive if they've treated you for a while and have seen how you've responded to treatment or not responded to treatment and seen you comply and trying to get better. Um, so I'm, I'm always weary about, you know, approaching doctors for, for social security disability, especially right off the bat, um, you know, and remember it always makes it into the chart notes. You know, the doctor will write in there, patients ask me about social security disability and, you know, that gets reviewed too. So, you know, it's, it's a touchy one, you know, like anything, it depends. It really depends on the doctor, your relationship. I hope that that was an answer. Um, 
what other scenarios um, in terms of folks, you know, as you, as you describe this in terms of something that is going to last, you know, beyond a certain period of time, um, are there conversations that come up with insurers, with HR? Um, I'm just curious um, I'm sure. what the gamut can run in terms of people understanding, you know, if, if they're facing long-term disability. I'm, I'm genuinely curious where suggestions may be coming from. Um, do, are there discussions with insurers, with HR, um, or, you know, strictly medical? What avenues may this all come from? And, and of course, an individual who's actually going through this um, is, is, you know, may or may not be thinking about this. And are you asking who actually suggests to somebody or, to pursue or, disability? Or begins these kind of conversations with them? Oh, geez, I don't know. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect your HR department to do it. Um, you know, unless you're missing work and they're saying, you know, this isn't working out, you know, you, you better look for another option. I, I don't know of many okay. examples I can think of where HR have gotten in and, you know, they're, they're, they'll are they point you to the direction of things maybe, but they're concerned whether you're going to work or not. Um, now, sometimes companies may have their own private disability, you know, through an UNAM or a, a Reliant or something, and HR can help with that. I didn't go into private disability, but um, usually it's the people just, have the ones people I deal with, um, they just come to the conclusion they, they're just not making it. You know, they're not able to show up at work. They're not able to do their job. It's become too painful, whatever the physical condition, whatever the mental condition, they, they just can't do it. Sometimes it's family they talk to, spouse, um, and their doctors, you know. Um, I'm not saying I'm not saying doctors won't help. I'm just saying, you know, be cautious with your doctors. You know, they're very busy. So um, but, you know, it's, I wouldn't suggest waiting around for someone to bring it up to you, you know, cause that might not happen, you know, and it's, it's, um, yeah, I, I I'm not sure that, 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 that there's going to be a HR or a insurance company is going to say, Hey, look, maybe you, you should consider long-term disability. They, they just don't function that way, at least in my experience. Uh, yes. Uh, one question is, what would you recommend for, I guess, people who uh, English is a second language? Because, you know, it's a very complicated field. So, What's that now? Uh, if English is a second language, like... Mm -hmm. Well, I guess it really depends on what the first language is. Um, you know, that's a tough one. I mean, there's bilingual attorneys out there. Um, you know, um, geez, I can't, I don't... You know, it's funny, if... if, if, if um, if you know the topic, sometimes you could pick up on languages. Like if I know what we're talking about, I can understand some Spanish, but in general, you know, if, if they don't have um, a family member, you know, I would say 90% of the, of the ESL clients I have had, have had a, a kid, you know, teenager, young adult, someone in their family that speaks English just fine. And I dealt with them. Um, I can only, I've done it a long time. I've only had a couple where I couldn't communicate, but there's, there's generally, um, you know, an attorney out there to speak the language. If not, then um, like I said, you're gonna have to find someone to help, um, you know. Now for social security, they have interpreters. Um, at the hearing, they can pick up the phone and call a service and get someone to interpret in almost every language imaginable, but, um, you know, it's, I think it's important to, um, to have someone that you can deal with, you know, um, it's one thing to deal with an attorney through, through a family member or someone else. And, you know, because, you know, a, a good attorney will know what's needed. You don't, you don't almost have to have everything come to you right out of the client's mouth. You can review the records, ask specific questions and know to go forward. But when it comes to testifying, what I found is there's a lot of times People can speak just enough English to get out a brief explanation, but then when they're they're questioned, 
on specifics and to explain in detail, they, they can't do it. And, and that, you know, so you, you want to make sure you have the interpreters for the cases. But again, with, with, with um, English as a second language, it depends, like anything else, it depends. You know, if you can get someone to help you or not. Um, you know, attorneys are, you know, we, we run the gamut too as to what languages we speak and don't speak. And, you know, they, they have to be comfortable with, with, with who's representing them. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Is it possible for somebody to qualify for both veterans disability and social security disability benefits? I believe so. Um, well, yes, it is possible. I think it depends on what the benefits are. Now, if you're getting VA benefits, you're not going to get SSI unless your VA benefits are really small because SSI, you know, will, will get reduced based on other benefits. But um, I've had plenty of clients who've had service related disabilities through the VA um, that I've represented in social security disability cases. Um, I think that, now I'm not an expert on VA benefits. There may be some VA benefits if they're non-service connected that might get offset and reduced based on social security. But for a lot of people, they, they receive both. Um, now the frustrating thing with VA is over the years, you might be found 100% disabled by the VA, which is also based on the ability to, you know, about being unemployable, but social security doesn't have to follow that, you know, they'll look at it, but um, they're not bound by it. Now, if you do have a hundred percent VA rating, they will expedite your case. So that is one thing, but, um, and it really depends on the judges that, you know, how much they look at it. But again, it's, they're not bound by it, but you can get both benefits. Yes. If, if you're successful in your claims. This concept of having perhaps multiple umbrellas, if someone were injured and were receiving workers' compensation or some sort of public disability benefit payments, would that impact their Social Security benefits? It can, yes. It shouldn't prevent you from applying. You don't need to wait for them to end because you may still get something. Um, but in California, your social security can be offset based on workers' comp or other public disability benefits. And what that means is, is a California state disability. It's not a dollar for dollar offset. It's a, it's a formula they use. And geez, I don't want to be wrong, but it's, it's basically they come up with your ACE number, your average earnings and, you know, whatever that is, there's a formula they come up with where you could receive only so much in combined benefits. So um, if you're getting already 2000 a month in state disability and the formula says you can have a combined benefit of, you know, 3,500, then that leaves enough room to get another $1,500 in state disability or workers comp. And so you can get that if, you're, if your social security is $2,000, they'll chop it down to, so it fits in that number. Um, sometimes the offset, and that probably didn't make sense. It, it's, but it, it, it's it, there's a formula. It's not dollar for dollar. Sometimes it results in a in a large offset, maybe a complete offset, and sometimes the workers' comp or state disability isn't high enough to offset it at all. So um, there's no reason to wait. You know, um, just go ahead and apply and let, let 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 the offsets happen as they will. You're still you're still better off getting it done. And that's my opinion. You know, someone might tell you otherwise. If a student loan is discharged because of disability, does that impact the recipient's disability insurance or if they are receiving supplemental SSI? Oh, good question. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Um, we'll both do a search. <laughs> yeah, that, that I'm not sure about. I, yeah, I know there's tax implications for getting a... Um, a student loan forgiven for disability, I think, but I'm not a tax attorney. Um, I don't, you know, SSI really is based on whether you actually receive the money, you know? So I don't know what they really look at a student loan that maybe you received the money um, 10 years ago, if now you're not paying it. 
I don't think so, but but I I can't say I can't say honestly that has that one hasn't come up for me. So um, first thing, if you get it forgiven, talk to talk to someone about taxes. I don't know if it would affect social security at all. I really couldn't tell you. Could you tell us anything about the concept of the ticket to work program? Oh wow. Um, not in this short of time, but I'll say this. Social Security has work incentive programs, both on the SSI side, I believe, Ticket to Work's on the SSI. And then they also have the um, trial work period on the SSDI side. And you can find those usually online. I think there's the Red Book online, it'll talk to you about them. And what they do is they allow people to attempt to work under certain circumstances um, without putting your benefits at risk, you know, not forever, you know, things can change. I, I haven't had as much experience with ticket to work as I have had with trial work periods and extend the period of eligibility and, and, the, and the, the work incentives on the SSDI side. But um, so no, I, I really couldn't give a thorough explanation of ticket to work, but it is a work incentive program that you need to work out with the local office first before you do anything. Um, and, and, you know, it'll give you a chance to try to work and see what you can do without losing your benefits. But again, don't just come to them six months after the fact and say, hey, I've been working and, you know, is this ticket to work? You've got to work with them from the beginning. Sure. May I ask one last question? Sure. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the disability update reports? Disability update reports? Right. I was doing a little research before we began, and it's referenced under the continuing disability review, which apparently they require to, them to do by law, um, periodically oh, updating. You know what? Okay. I, didn't, I don't think I mentioned this. Did, did I mention the CDRs, the reviews? I didn't. Okay. So I'll just, just really quickly. If you win your benefits, one of the, the misconceptions about Social Security, a term that's often used that's not accurate, Social Security is not permanent disability. Okay. While there are clearly some conditions that people can be unfortunate to have that are not going to get better, possibly terminal. For the most part, people aren't considered to be permanently disabled. And Social Security does have what are called continuing disability reviews. And every now and then, Congress will budget for them to do them more. Um, you know, yeah, you know it's, someone decides it needs to be done. I mean, but it's always part of. It. Now, they're generally every three years, they can be coded at five years or seven years. I think they can be coded at not at all. I've seen judges order them after 12 months. And what normally happens is you'll first be content. Now, and they'll do it to anyone. I used to tell people that were in their late 50s and 60s, oh, they're never gonna do it, but I've seen it happen more recently. So unlikely, but I don't wanna tell anyone that you're beyond review. So the people that get picked on the most are those who get their benefits and drop out of medical or, or mental health care. Don't do that, then you're, you're an easy target. Um, but what happens is you'll, you'll start off getting a letter from the local office and it'll have, I believe that disability update report. And it'll ask you, you know, whether you still consider yourself disabled. They'll ask if you've worked at all since um, whatever date disability started. They'll ask about, you know, um, you know, current medical treatment and, you know, just some basic questions. And it could end right there. All right, and they find you disabled, they put, put it off and you know, we'll see you in another three or five or seven years. If not, what happens is it goes back to that state agency I mentioned and it's treated almost like a brand new claim. They're gonna gather records, they may have you evaluated and you know, once again, your, your fate's in the hands of doctors you'll never look at or talk to or anything like that. The standard's different. The standard is it has to be, there has to be medical improvement, but to a level that allows you to return to substantial gainful activity. Just being a little better isn't enough. It has to be enough to return you to work. And, um, you know, if they say yes, they will 
let you know that they've decided your disability ended. You have the same appeal rights. The difference with a, a continuing disability review though is while you have 60 days to appeal, you have 10 days to appeal and keep your benefits going while you appeal. Now you have to do that. The attorney can't do that for you. Um, and they kind of make you sign something saying you realize that if you end up losing, you got to pay all these benefits back, you know, so, but you have the chance of keeping them. And you go on to the reconsideration level again, you can ask for an informal hearing. You know, they'll have you speak to a hearing officer, not a judge. And I, I don't know, I have mixed feelings about those. I've sat in on a couple and I wasn't happy with them, but you know, you want to take every chance you can. And eventually you get back to um, administrative law judge if they find that you're not better. So, so yeah, that's the continuing disability review. And the form you mentioned, I believe is the first one they send out. Um, it asks you all the updated questions, your condition, work and everything since you were found to be disabled. So that's a pretty time sensitive response um, that you described 10, the days, 10 days to respond. Yes. Yeah. It is, and you can't do that online. I, I learned that some years back. I couldn't, I tried to do it for someone because um, it had been a former client and I, I tried to help him with the continuing review and I couldn't do it. You know, he had to go into the local office. So, um, and it's 10 days. Again, if you're close to it, you know, I mean, they're not unforgiving about it, but you want to be as close to the 10 days and you can keep that going up through the hearing level. If the judge denies you, it's over. You know, you can still go to the appeals council. I have one of these in federal court right now, but um, you can keep the benefits going at least through the through the judge's decision. Um, but yeah, they're they're time sensitive. With the changes that are happening all around us, um, it's it's interesting that something like that could not be updated online. When I was doing research on this, it indicated that you could report wages online if you're receiving Social Security Disability Insurance or SSI. Um, but something that is as time sensitive as, as that, I and, and this is subjective on my part, I hope that that changes um, yeah. and there's a better opportunity. I don't know. I, I think they like the idea of looking you in the eye and telling you, you will pay this back if you're going to be, you know, um, I don't know why, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of them not having done it. You know, you still can't do SSI applications online, even though I think they have, they're starting to at least let you do a shell of one, you know, um, to at least get it started online. Um, you know, I'll mention one more thing about what you mentioned reporting wages. Social security has always been really vague. I thought about the right way to report wages and when you should do it and, and all that stuff. Um, so many times people think, well, you know, social security taxes are being taken out of my check. They know. And I have to explain, well, they don't know yet. You know, they'll all cross reference and they'll find out two years from now and then ask you about it. And then you might have a huge overpayment. But one of the tools social security offers is what they call the My SSA account. And um, you can go to the SSA.gov and, and sign up for one of those. You can check your earnings record. You can check your disability rate, your retirement rate. Um, now those are projections. Those are based on presumptions that you're gonna keep earning money and stuff, but it gives you a good idea. Um, you can get a new social security card. It gives you status of your claims, even though I'm not sure of the statuses they give and it's, and it's not something I see. I, you know, clients will ask me about what's on their my SSA account. I don't have access to that. Um, but it's a good thing to have. Make sure you keep your password somewhere and your username because I've heard they're very hard to deal with if you lose it or forget it. So, and I think that has means of reporting, reporting direct deposit, reporting wages. Um, whatever you do, whatever you report, keep a receipt, keep a record note it down, don't rely on social security, you always record what you've done. Um, but that's that's their new tool, the My SSA account. It's not that new, but that's, they want everyone to be using that. Do we have any more questions tonight?
Richard, I'd like very much to thank you for taking time to join us and for this overview. Well, I hope um, it made sense. <laughs> There's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts, and I started to realize as I was looking through this in the weeks that we've been talking, um, you know, the very basics of this, um, being your own historian in terms of trying to get your records together about how you comply with reporting um, and all of this, it's it's a lot of information. And I think, you know, this opportunity to have, you know, even an overview of this is really valuable, and we very much appreciate it. Well, um, there are lot, lots of moving parts. There is, and Social Security is difficult. You know, they may find that you're disabled due to a physical or a mental condition, but then they expect you to follow up on this, this crazy set of rules and requirements after they find you disabled. And sometimes they're unforgiving, you know, and it, it just, it's tough. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, it's not an easy program. I was really struck by the fact that, you know, we make a lot of assumptions that, you know, especially folks that have gone through many, many scenar different scenarios with getting health care about how to get all of this information together. Um, it's it's not quite trying to figure out a stock that you bought six splits ago, which can be confusing enough on its own. This is your life. This is your health. And mm -hmm. this is ultimately a presentation that you're going to bring for someone else to review. Right. So what you brought tonight was greatly appreciated. Um, we thank you very, very much. And... I have no doubt that this will be a popular um, recording for people to reference. And your time was greatly appreciated. Well, then I was glad to do it. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you. I'm going to sign out. I am going to invite our listeners to join us next month for Sean Stevens, who will be coming to us from the Marin um, Veterans Department. Hopefully, we will have folks with questions about uh, that department. And as always, I very much appreciate our speaker, and in particular, our law librarian, who goes out of his way to make this program and other great programs happen. Thank you all, and have a nice evening.